We are continuing on in our beginner's discipleship classes, and uh, I will uh, mix it up throughout time, uh, giving various topics. That's what I decided to do on Sundays, so it's not going to stick to a certain series. I'm going to be mixing up topics. That way, you all can get a variety and spiritually grow. But anyway, in beginner's discipleship, what we're covering is theological studies. In theological studies, there are many different branches. Bibliology, which is the doctrine of the Bible. Theology is the doctrine of God. Christology, which is the doctrine of Christ. And then you see down here pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And then over here you see uh, anthropology, which is the doctrine of man. Harmark theology, the doctrine of sin. And then soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. And then Christianology, if there is such a thing, doctrine of Christians. And then uh, the other side will show the other branches that, Lord willing, uh, will cover. But they are ecclesiology, doctrine of the church. Angelology, doctrine of angels. Demonology, doctrine of devils. And eschatology, doctrine of end times. Uh, we'll be covering uh, soteriology today, and a study we'll cover in soteriology is justification. So we will talk about the subject of justification, and usually on people's mind is why is justification so important? What's so important about justification? Justification is very crucial for our understanding because we do not properly know what justification means. We just take it for granted that we are justified by faith alone, but you have to first ask yourself again, the problem with Christians is that they jump the gun assuming they understand the terms and the meanings without actually studying the terms and the meanings. Do you know what justified means? See? Do you know what it actually means? Do you know the operation of why justification comes out? Why would God use the word justify? Couldn't he have just used the word saved by faith alone? Why do we talk about being justified by faith alone? So it shows right here that we really do not understand. That's why it's important to go back to the basics and understand what these terms mean and what the context, the biblical context, surrounds it. Why is justification by faith important? Is important is we need to understand the problem first. So, to understand the problem, let's go to the definition. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 16. To understand the problem, the definition of justification, let's start out with justify. Justify, the most simple word. Justification is the noun of it. Justify is a shorter word, and that's a verb. Justify does not mean pardon. That's what people wrongly assume. When we are justified by his blood, for example, or we are justified for salvation, we assume that's, that means to be pardoned, to be forgiven of our sins. But that's not true. That's only a partial definition. It is true that pardon is inclusive, but that is not the entire meaning, uh, meaning itself. Justify actually means to declare righteous, to declare righteous. Why that is important is because of 1 Timothy 3.16. Let's assume justify means to be pardoned, to be forgiven. Then we are saying that Jesus Christ received pardon. Jesus Christ was forgiven, which doesn't make sense. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We know that's Jesus Christ, justified in the spirit. 
So Jesus Christ, when he became a man, he was justified in the spirit. Now, either that means he'd been pardoned of his sins in the spirit, or that's not what it obviously means, which we would obviously see it the latter. So, justified, it makes more sense on being declared righteous. Here, this definition fits that Jesus Christ is declared righteous in the spirit because of the way he lived his life. He lived a justified life. He lived a life where people can declare him to be a righteous person. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 18 now. Ezekiel chapter 18, and we'll look at verse 20. Now that we understand the definition of justification or justify, let's look at the problem. That way we can truly understand the meaning. We can truly understand the importance of justification. If God is to declare us righteous, that means that we'll be righteous enough to go to heaven. That means our sins are cleared, forgiven. But in order for God to justify us, he has to do it without condoning our sin. In order for God to save us from hell, we have to be justified. That's the problem, is that to be declared uh, righteous, let's see right here, Oop, let's put, put it in this context, okay. If we look at declared righteous, we know that this means no sin. Plain as day. And we can be in heaven with God. So pretend that this is our home in heaven. If we are going to be qualified for this, notice Notice that it has to be, let me draw that here. Oh, come on. All right, there we go. In order to go up here, notice no sin. No sin. Now, you and I, that is a problem. We have sin in us. If God is to justify us, Here's the problem here. Those that are declared righteous can go to heaven, right? 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory, right? So a justified man can go to heaven, right? All right. Justified people can go to heaven. But here's the problem. That means declared righteous is no sin. Here you are with sin. Right. How can God justify you if you have sin? Yeah. See that? That doesn't make any sense then. So we automatically assume that because ju God justifies us, we can go to heaven. But you don't understand what that means. No, if you say it that way, it's a problem actually. It's a problem. If you're going to say God justifies you to go to heaven, the contradiction to that statement is that God declares you to be righteous with your sin and allows you to go to heaven. That doesn't make sense at all. So he has to get rid of that sin. This is why justify is going to be important because the declaring righteous part it has to do something. It can't just, God can't just justify you. In other words, God can't just declare you righteous with your sin. So justification has to do something, whatever that something is. That's what we're studying today. That's what we're trying to find out. We need to find out what justification will have to do so that we can go to heaven. 
Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the Bible points out this, that God cannot compromise with sin. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That verse is very plain that God says, if you're wicked, you are counted to be wicked. If you're righteous, your righteousness will be counted upon you. So that verse is very plain that God will make sure righteous people will be declared righteous, and wicked people will be declared wicked. How can God declare wicked people to be righteous? That's contrary to his book in Ezekiel 18.20. Righteous people should be declared righteous, not wicked people. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1, this problem is further given. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1, this problem is further given. If a judge justifies the sinner, then he is a rotten judge. He is a corrupt judge. Now think about this. If, you're, if we know that God is the holy righteous judge, and we know that God judges sins and sinners, for us to say that God justifies wicked, rotten sinners will make God a corrupt judge. You see the problem right here? So we Christians, don't get me wrong, we do say that God justifies sinners. Don't get me wrong about that. But I don't think we understand the problem here. And there's a, a deeper meaning behind God justifying the wicked. All right? But it doesn't mean when God justifies the wicked that God declares wicked people to be righteous because that would make him a corrupt judge. So we got a problem right here. This is what we got to understand, the contradiction here. So this is a contradiction. We have to understand contrary. This cannot be reconciled with. God is a holy judge. So this pronounces judgment. Why? Because that is one of God's holy attributes is his judgment and justice. If God justifies sin or sinners, right? We got a problem here. If he justifies the sinners here, then he compromises his justice and then he is not a fair judge or a just judge. What makes it a just judge is going to be one that doesn't justify sinners. So Deuteronomy 25.1 shows this. A judge is supposed to justify the righteous. In verse 1, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1. I went to Numbers. I'm really sorry about that. Let me turn over there real quick. Nah. The Bible points out right here, if there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Now look at that. Righteous people are justified. Do you understand that? Not wicked. That leaves us uh, with a problem here. We know we're not righteous people. We know we're wicked people. So how can we say that we're justified by faith alone when we're wicked? That's a contradiction. See that? Unless there's a deeper meaning behind justification that we don't know about. But let's continue on. Let's look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 7. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 7. Now, can't God be merciful and gracious and then give a break? Absolutely not. He cannot even allow 1%. He has to make sure that the guilty are condemned guilty. God refuses. As a matter of fact, you have to understand this. God refuses to justify sinners. As a holy judge, justice and judgment demands refusal of justification. So this is contrary to justify. They cannot be reconciled. Notice again this boundary line, it's contrary. Yeah. 
It's contrary. God refuses, absolutely refuses. He will not give a break. He won't give. His grace and his mercy is infinite, but that will not, be comprom uh, that will not compromise his justice. So we got a problem. Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 7. Except yeah, keep thee far from a matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. Absolute problem here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5. What if God justifies sinners, then God has to judge himself. Do you understand that? God will have to pronounce himself to be guilty. God will have to pronounce himself as a corrupt sinner. So God cannot contradict his own attribute. So when we say that Jesus Christ justifies wicked sinners, then you know what? God should be judging himself. God should condemn himself. So then why do we teach justification by faith alone? That wicked sinners can be justified. We have to understand the deeper meaning here. We don't really understand like we think we do. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 22. The Bible says, Isaiah 5 22, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Now, notice the scripture is very plain as day that God judges those who justify wicked people. So if you're saying that God justifies wicked sinners like you and I so that we can go to heaven, then uh, God has to judge himself. God is guilty himself. Go to Luke chapter uh, 16, Luke chapter 16. Well, then, shouldn't we live clean, pastor? Shouldn't we live righteous lives? That way we could be justified. No, actually, God condemns that too. So you're in a problem here. Even if you live righteously or declare yourself to be righteous, God actually condemns those who justify themselves before God. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because I don't care how much you live righteously, your actions in living righteous will never erase the sins that you commit as well. So here you are in sin and you're in righteousness and here is God, no sin. That is to be declared righteous, no sin. So even if you live righteous so that God can declare you righteous, God cannot allow that. He condemns those people, actually. So look at Luke chapter 16, and then we'll read verse 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is what? Abomination in the sight of God. All right, then that means... We're in trouble. We're in trouble. Why? Because, write down Romans 3.23. That's the whole bottom line. Write down Romans 3.23. The whole bottom line to this picture is because of Romans 3.23. So, in other words, no one is just. No one is justifiable. We're all doomed to hell. We're made, uh, we're condemned for hell itself. That's, right. That's what we are. Romans 3.23 shows, For all have sinned. That's the reasoning. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God can only be the one declared righteous. He is the one that's justified. But all of mankind, when we compare ourselves to God, the Bible says we fall short. Right. So because of that, we're all wicked. That's the re whole bottom line why we cannot go to heaven. So in other words, there is no way we can be justified. We're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. Unless God has to do something himself, which he's always a genius for doing so. So he came up with this brilliant operation called justification. The, w the word justification might seem to be the problem, but actually, it is the solution itself. And only a brilliant God can take a term that would be our doom.
to actually be our solution. And what a great God we serve. So go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. So how is this going to work where he can be able to uh, declare wicked people to be righteous without compromising his justice and judgment on wickedness? So the solution is that Jesus Christ himself volunteered to live the justified life. That's why 1 Timothy 3.16, it points out right here in 1 Timothy 3.16, which we saw before, Jesus Christ was what? Justified in the Spirit. So Jesus Christ took on the justified life. So he lived the justified life for us. So we don't have to do it. So Jesus Christ, what he did was he switched places with you. Now that's a brilliant God. Once he switches that, so here he is, he lives the justified life. You can't. Remember, God will condemn you if you declare yourself to be righteous. So Jesus says, I will live the justified life for you. So then all he has to do is swap it off with your sin. So he switches it off with your sin and gives you his righteous life. So then by giving you his righteous life, now God can declare you to be righteous and Jesus Christ to be the one who is made sin for us. So Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. The Bible says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And then count that with verse 5, verse 5. But to him that worketh not. See that? So you're not justifying yourself. But believeth on him. So all you do is believe. But you notice right here on him. It's some, uh, people say, well, I believe, I believe. No, do you know what you're believing in? You know what you're putting on? Jesus Christ, who took your sin, who gave you his righteousness. When you, be, when you believe on him that justifieth the ungodly, see that? So I put my trust, I put all my faith, I am resting completely, leaning on what? Jesus Christ himself, who lived the justified, the righteous life for me. By doing that, then that act of faith of my part is the verse says his faith is counted for righteousness so i don't have to live the righteous life all i have to do is put my faith in it and that puts me in righteousness that operation defines justification see that so that's a brilliant that's so brilliant of god so all you've got to do you don't have to justify yourself all you have to do, since Jesus Christ is switching it off for you, is to simply put your faith into it. So just believe. When you trust in that, put your faith on him, then what happens is automatically, as you soon put your faith on him, then you are in the justified life. Hence, this is why we say that this is now being justified by faith alone. See that? So now we know why justification by faith. See that? That's why we say by faith. Justification by faith is so important. Why? Because faith is that act that we did, our part that we did, that gave that whole operation of justification because Jesus Christ did the work. He lived it out for us. That's important to understand. Now, we're going to look at the contents of justification. So go to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. What you thought before about justification, you now know better, right? You now know better. So when you say justified by faith, this time when you say it, don't just say it tongue in cheek. Okay. Know what it means. Know what it exactly entails, what specifics happen 
the problems and the solutions, what God did. It's, it's an absolutely brilliant thing what God did. So let's look at Micah, and then we'll look at chapter 7, chapter 7. We're going to look at the contents of justification itself. In the contents of justification, I kind of like this picture. We see right here two things that I want you to notice. Two things that I want you to take note concerning about justification. Notice right here, which already you saw from what I told you about the solution, the solution from justification. Remember that there was a switch, right? So a transfer. Now, from this transfer, we see that God calls it imputation now. Right. Now, a lot of people got to understand imputation is different from justification. Right. People think they're the same thing, but they're not. No. Imputation, this word, what that means is to be counted for righteousness. In other words, there was no actual act or transaction that took place that made you righteous. Even though you are still in guilt and in sin right here, God can still overlook it, even though you have it, okay? So you still have the guilt. But God can overlook that, and then he can just simply count you as righteous. That's what imputation means, which is very different from justification. Justification, remember, is that, uh, well, we'll come to that a little bit later. But I want you to go to, uh, I know I mentioned about Micah 7, but keep your hand there and go to Romans 3. All right, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. In justification, there are two contents that you want to keep in mind on how, uh, what justification consists of. It first consists of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. So look at Romans chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 22. The Bible points out right here, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So notice right here that the righteousness of God is imputed to you. Now, the word imputed is even more plain uh, when we look back at uh, Romans chapter 4, which we saw before, right? Notice in Romans uh, 4 and then verse 5, or verse 3 and 5, which we saw before, verse 3 and 5, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. And then verse 5, if you believe, then your faith is counted for righteousness. So notice right here that uh, you are counted righteous. But notice when we go back to Romans chapter 3 again, when we go back to Romans chapter 3 again, and then verse 24, after verse, uh, let me explain, after verse 22, when you're counted righteous, then verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. So justification, it will have imputation operating alongside with it. Once you believe on Christ, God imputes you his righteousness. In other words, he counts you righteousness. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Another benefit, when God imputes you his righteousness, people don't think about this. When a prisoner has served out his term, he is not justified like us in the sense where he might have similar rights to citizenship. But, us Christians, when we get justified and then our prison term or our prison sentence has already been fulfilled or carried out, we have rights to citizenship. 
That's a huge benefit on our part. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now when God counts you righteous, it's not just, hey, you served out your sentence, you can get out of prison, but also what is inclusive in this, not only he counts you righteous, but he counts you as a fellow citizen. So you have the rights of a citizen of heaven. So that's what imputation entails when he does the act of justification. But he can't just simply count you righteous. Justify means to be declared righteous. But recall I said that pardon is inclusive in there. Pardon is so important because you need to have the sins or the guilt to be truly cleared away. Imputation is simply counting you righteous while overlooking the guilt. But in justification, it won't just have imputation where it overlooks the guilt. It will actually clear the guilt. It will actually pardon the guilt. So look at Micah chapter 7 and then verse 18. Your hand is there, so I'll just read it. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? And passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Notice right here that God can pardon iniquity. That he can forgive and remove the guilt and punishment. Go to Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. And we know this through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how our guilt and our sins are forgiven and removed. Go to Acts chapter 13, and then we'll look at verse 38 through 39. Notice that justification, one of its contents, includes forgiveness of sin and removal of guilt and punishment. So Acts chapter 13, verse 38 through 39. The Bible says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Notice right here you receive forgiveness of sins. And when it says justified from all things, it, it indicates right here a removal or a separation of sins itself. Wow. So that's what justification has is it's not just a tr transfer where Jesus Christ gives you his righteousness so that he can count you righteous, but he also truly gets rid of the guilt. So you being, think about this, you are that prisoner. Being that prisoner stuck with your guilt and your sin, it's not like, it's when, uh, it's not like when you're a prisoner that the judge counts you righteous and when people say, well, you committed that crime, though, you committed that wrongdoing, the prisoner not just only says, well, no, the judge counted me as innocent. The judge counted me as one that is not guilty. The judge counted me as righteous, but also as if the crime never happened at all. So while on top of that, the benefits of a citizen... That's the contents of justification right here. That's the free gift of justification, and that's what uh, it entailed everything within its contents. Okay, we're going to look at Galatians 2. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 2. Now we're going to come across justification is not by works. Justification is not by works. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen on that one. A lot of people will argue that for you to be justified, there has to be works involved. But no, that is not true. When you and I got justified by 
faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely no works involved. So I will eventually draw it out, but first let's look at a few passages. We'll go, uh, excuse me, we'll go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So the verse is plain that there is no works involved. The verse says that you are justified only by faith in Jesus Christ. If you insist that the works say you'll be justified, then the verse says, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, notice, compare with James 2. James chapter 2. Now, people will keep pulling up James chapter 2 on you. Now, they're going to insist this. So here's the problem here. James 2 has been the huge stumbling block for people's salvation because they assume that within James chapter 2, that when you get justified, it is talking about right here, uh, justified by works, and then we see other passages where it says it is justified by faith. And then it says here, not works. It makes it very plain here. Now, uh, if you're going to be honest as a Bible believer, it's simple. You just have to rightly divide it, right? So what you can do is just simply rightly divide it when you go to James chapter... Well, let's first look at James chapter 2. And then notice right here at verse 21, the problem is... Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And then verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. That is a huge stumbling block where people say that it's not by faith alone. There has to be works involved. Now, the simple answer if you're a Bible believer, is to divide it. In James 1.1, 1, 1, notice who he's speaking to. James chapter 1 and verse 1. So he is not speaking to you Christians. James chapter 2 is at a different time period here. So in our time period, we are in the church age. So this is the age of the church. But this one is a future time period. And this future time period is the tribulation. And this is for Jews. So this is tribulation Jews. This is not for church age Christians. That's where uh, people make the mistake here. If you look at James 1.1, 1, 1, notice that it is speaking to the 12 tribes of Israel. James writes it to the 12 tribes of Israel. And notice that the time period that he's addressing is chapter 5 and verse 3. Chapter 5 and verse 3, it is referring to last days. It is referring to the tribulation time period. The Bible says, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, people will make a lot of pretty sayings, so go to Romans chapter 3 now. Romans chapter 3. They're going to try to reconcile without rightly dividing here, like what we did. So we rightly divided it. James 2 is for tribulation Jews, and then in this scenario right here, this is for church-age Christians. But uh, today's teachers, what they're going to try to do is, well, in Galatians, it's talking about that there is no works involved for salvation, so you're saved by faith. However, James 2 is trying to tell you 
that if you have this salvation by faith, this faith will work, will work itself out. So, uh, but, you know, what they're doing is just using uh, different wordings, which is acting contradictory. That's what it is. So they're just contradicting themselves. They just don't sound contradictory by using different wordings. All right, that's how they get around that. No, just simply leave the word as it says. If it says, not by faith alone, but perfected by works, and that's what it means. And then if it says, not by work, uh, if in another passage, not by works, but by faith only, leave it as it says. They can try to use pretty wording that they want to, that if you're really saved by faith, works will come out of you. But that verse says in Galatians 3 again, that the verse says, for by works shall no flesh be justified. They might argue that in order for people to declare you just or justified, in the eyes of man, they have to see you work out your faith. That verse says you are not justified by works. Galatians 3, very plain. But then if you look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 26, the verse says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. There's being justified. That he might be just and the justifier of him, which what? Believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. See, you cannot add works in there. You cannot add works in there. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 is an ugly verse. Chapter 4 and verse 5 points out, even if you don't work at all, but if you just choose to believe, your faith is counted for righteousness, which we read before, right? Chapter 4 and verse 5. So there's absolutely no works involved. So the simple, notice how we simplify this. It is simple if you divide. So it is important to rightly divide. If you rightly divide, then you're going to get your basic doctrine of justification correct. So just rightly divide things, and then it will work itself out very easily like that. So what we realize for our salvation today, when we're justified, there is absolutely no works involved. We're going to uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and then verse 33. Romans chapter 8, and then we'll look at verse 33. Now we're going to look at the means of justification. We're going to look at the means of justification. When we look at the means of justification, this is really cool right here. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. This is how justification was able to operate. A lot of people don't think about this. Justification just doesn't come out of thin air, guys. You need certain people. You need certain operations. You need certain situations set up so that justification can work. So how does justification work? Well, simple. You first need Romans 8.33. Notice right here the Bible says... Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is what? God that justifieth. Okay, do you know how justification works? First of all, you need... Oops. First of all, you need God, obviously. All right? So you need God because he's the one that justifieth. All right, so you got God. Now, the problem is here... You are, so this is you, and you have sin, right? So we need certain means set up, okay? You can't be justified. So you need several things set up. One, you need God. So that is the author. So you need to look at the author of justification. There needs someone who needs to authorize it. So that's a no-brainer. Two is Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Two, you need the source. You need the source. And that is God's grace. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. The Bible says, 
being justified freely by His grace. See that? That's the source through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So to receive the just, justification, God is not just going to justify you. Because if He sees you like that, He's going to condemn you, right? So He's got to have a heart right here. So He's got to have a heart right there, and that heart's name is grace. So because of grace... He's able, he's able to, okay, I love that sinner, so I'm going to justify that sinner somehow. So there is the source. So the source of justification, that's two. Three is Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Three, now we need to look at the cause of our justification, the actual cause of our justification. And what that is? The blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So he, even though he has grace on you, he can't just justify you. That grace is going to make him commit an act, and that act is where he sheds his precious blood for you. So then the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ washes it away and then your sin is cleared. So that is now the cause of justification. That's three, the cause of justification. And lastly, four, look at Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four and verse 25, verse 25. Let us look at the recognition of justification. The recognition of justification. That is his resurrection. The Bible says in Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again. See, he resurrected. Why? For our justification. Why did Jesus Christ raise himself from the dead? Because the author will not do any good if he's dead. So he shed his blood, and that was the cause to wash it, but it's not, he's not going to do any good if he's dead. So he has to become alive. Uh, only a living author is what's going to count all this. So that's why he had to raise himself from the dead, his resurrection. That's why his resurrection is so important. That is what? That, that way everyone can witness and recognize, ah, because the author is alive, that's why that justification is still operable. It's still operating. So that is the recognition. That is the recognition. Or the, the recognizing. Oh, what just happened here? Okay. It recognizes our justification right here. Okay. Now we go to Romans 5. Here's the fun one. This is good. All right, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to show you three things here what justification does. This is pretty cool here. I'm going to show you three things. All right. Romans chapter 5, and then look at verse 1. The Bible says, therefore being justified by faith. So we're going to look at three results of justification here. All at Romans chapter 5. This is really cool. All right. There are three results of justification. So what? Now that you and I are justified... Here are the benefits you and I get. Here are the three results. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we now understand what that means, right? Being justified by faith, it is an important doctrine. Uh, let's come over here. Okay. Whoa. Okay, let me erase this part. Okay. The first result is actually peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice right here, therefore, right? Being justified by faith. So, in other words, because of this, you can have peace with God. So you, don't, you and I don't have to worry about hellfire. We don't have to worry about losing our uh, citizenship. We don't have to worry about our crimes being brought up. Our sins being brought up. They, they just, as if they, uh, you never sin, as the song goes, justified. In other words, just if I never sin, right? 
That's the idea. The second thing is Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You have access to God. You have access to His grace. You have ac Look at this. You have access to His grace. Do you know what the riches of His grace entail? I'll be preaching about that later on today, actually. But man, His grace, I mean, the, the 200 plus promises in the Bible is just a small example of His grace. And then not only that, you get to go to heaven, that kind of an access. So that's your result of being justified. And then talking to Him face to face, Dying to him face to face up in glory and through prayer. Something else. Now, Romans 5, 3, the third result. And not only so. Oh, so in other words, this is not all of the benefits from being justified by faith. Here's a good one that you're going to like. But what? We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. That's a miracle. So even in the hard times you're going through, you can praise God about it. Even in unfairness, bad things in life. If good things in life aren't good enough for you, even the bad things in life, God will make it good for you. So you can glorify God through your tribulations. Why? Because it makes you better. It makes you better. But also, uh, it gives you, all the way down to verse 5, it gives you this hope that God gives to you at the end. And then... We already know his promise, like Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. So that's the result of justification. Now I'm going to give you the summary of justification. And then we'll close it off right here. All right. So when we... Uh, that is not the right one here. Hold on. Okay, there we go. All right. Anyways, okay. So let's come across the summary of justification. I want you to go to Luke... Uh, Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 33. Romans chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 33. Let's see right here. I will pick the color green. That way people can see it plainly here. All right. So in justification, I'm going to summarize how it goes. Now justified justification a, lo a lot of that is believe it or not it is a legal term it is something that is done judicially it is a judicial act so here we are with our sins brought up before the courtroom of heaven but in justification what god does as the judge is that when he justifies us we are justified judicially by God. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. So in the courtroom, we are justified. Romans chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 33. The Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? See that? It's a judicial thing going on. Someone's charging you guilty. But the Bible says it is God that justifieth. See, you are justified judicially. Not only that... Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. So judicially speaking, you are justified, but also meritoriously you are justified. Meritoriously. Look at Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. The reason why that in this judicial scene that you are still justified and the reason why by merit you are still justified is because Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was able to solve it all for you. So judicially God justifies you. Meritoriously Jesus Christ justifies you. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 53 and then verse 11. The Bible says... He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So Jesus Christ, so meritoriously you are justified because Jesus Christ paid it for you. 
Jesus Christ was the one that paid it with his death on the cross of Calvary. So it is by merit as well. So notice that justification has worth in it, judicially speaking, and it has merit within it. Go to Romans 5, 1. Romans chapter 5. We are also justified uh, mediatively, mediatively. Go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, which we read before, that we are therefore being justified by faith. We have peace in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we are justified, faith is what mediates it for us. So we have a mediator. We, it is mediated on our behalf. Mediated by faith. Now, if you want to see an example of all three acts taking place of justification in a judicial scenery where there was merit paid for and also you've been mediated, go to Luke chapter 18. So all of this will encompass Luke chapter 18. This all can be best summarized by Luke chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. And then we will call it a day. Luke chapter 18. And then we'll look at verses 13 through 14. Notice right here that a humble sinner can receive justification. And how he does it is that he humbles himself and pleads for salvation. When he pleads to God for salvation, then what happens right then and there, God justifies that sinner. Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. If you want to know how to be justified, then this is what you need to do. Luke 18, 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So if you want to get justified, then... Why not humble yourself, sinner, and then plead to God for salvation? And what will happen is that he will justify you Amen. on the spot. And that is how justification can be beautifully summarized, is that God, he judicially acts upon it and declares you righteous. And then Jesus Christ did the merit for you. And then the, all that is mediated by faith. And how that is all acted upon is by the very action that you did by humbling yourself as a sinner at the foot of the cross and then pleading to God for salvation. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you are justified and declared righteous. So that is the doctrine of justification. Amen. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more to a better understanding of your word, and our salvation, help us to be more appreciative. And I pray that you bless the service and the next hours. And then please bring the rest of the people safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.